In this video, I'd like to explain how a binary number system works. Let's say we have a whole bunch of apples. We don't know how many there are. There's actually several ways you can quantify this number. The first way is the way they taught us in elementary school. It's called the decimal system. Let's take a look at the way that works. Okay, we've got a bunch of buckets. And we're going to fill these buckets up with the apples. The trick is, is how you fill the buckets. The bucket on the right hand side, you can put one apple at a time into it. But if you're going to put any apples in this bucket, you have to put 10 at a time into it. This bucket requires groups of 100 apples, and this one requires groups of 1,000. We'll need to count how many times we fill each bucket. With the decimal system, the maximum number of times you can fill a bucket is 9 times. We chose the number 9 because the numbers 0 through 9 is 10 different digits, thus the word decimal. Okay, let's start filling buckets. We want to fill the largest bucket we can first. It's pretty obvious we don't have 100 apples, so we'll skip this bucket. Let's start filling the 10 apples bucket. Sort your apples into groups of 10. Dump the first group into the bucket. When you do this, increase the counter by 1. The second group goes in, then the third group. Okay, we have fewer than 10 apples. We'll put all the remaining apples into the one apple bucket. And there you have it. Using the decimal system, we had 31 apples. I know this description seems a little simplistic. In addition to determining how high your counter can go, the number system that you're using also determines how many apples you can put into each bucket. In decimal, each bucket is 10 times greater than the last one. So, knowing this, let's convert the number 31 back into real apples. We know we filled the 10 apple bucket 3 times, so that's the same as 3 times 10, which is equal to 30. The one apple bucket was filled one time. One times one is one. The concept I just explained for decimal is pretty close to the same for all other numbering systems. Here's where we start learning new stuff. Let's look at a binary number system using the same apples. Again, we'll have apple buckets, but we're going to change two things. The first is how many apples we'll put into each bucket, and how many times we can fill a bucket. Everything else is exactly the same. The first bucket will take one apple. Actually, that sounds like the last one we just did. But each succeeding bucket can now take double the apples as the previous bucket. So we can put 2 into this one, then 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. If you're thinking to yourself, these numbers sure sound familiar, you're absolutely right. You'll find these numbers correspond directly to any computer memory you're going to buy. For example, head on down to Costco, you'll find they're very fond of selling 128 gigabyte and 32 gigabyte memory sticks. That was a quick little sidebar. In addition to changing how many apples you can put into each bucket, the one other change is how many times you can fill each bucket. You can fill each bucket only one time. So a zero means an empty bucket, and a one means a full bucket. Then you move on to the next bucket. That's actually quite a bit simpler than decimal. Let's try an example. Just like before, we want to fill up the largest bucket first. So rearrange your apples into groups, then start filling buckets. So we've just shown that 11111 binary is the same number as 31 decimal. Let's prove that. Just like we did before, we need to multiply it out. Here's the really cool thing. Since you can only fill each bucket once, 1 times any number is that number. So in reality, we don't need to do any multiplication, just addition. Add together all of the full buckets. Here's our proof. But you may be asking, what do you do with the buckets that aren't full? Let's look at this example. 01001. Since the 16 apple bucket shows a 0, you just ignore it. 8 apples is a 1, so you add it. Ignore both 4 and 2, then add the 1. Your answer, this is the same thing as the number 9 in decimal. Now you may be asking yourself, what possible use could there be for a binary system? The answer to that one's easy. Computers. Computers operate entirely on a little item called a transistor. A transistor can be in one of two states, off or on. When it's off, it represents a zero, or it can be turned on, which will represent a one. Computers can do a remarkable thing with something as simple as off and on. You want to increase the power of the computer? Increase the number of transistors. This microchip can have hundreds of transistors within it. But for today's computers, you need something even smaller. 
They eventually miniaturized the transistor down to the molecular level and combined them into something called your computer CPU, or central processing unit. This one chip can have millions or even billions of transistors within it. Just as a quick side note, you've already been exposed to binary numbers, you just haven't known about it. The power switch on many appliances have binary numbers written right onto them. The zero means it's off, and the one means it's on. Another place you'll experience binary numbers is the world of aviation. This is called a dip switch module. It's a component that has many small mechanical switches on it. An avionics technician physically changes the position of the switch to either on or off to configure aviation systems for proper operation. I covered this switch extensively in my video labeled Octal to Hexadecimal to Binary Conversions. Let's move back into your house. If you're going to be installing your own home security system, you'll also be exposed to dip switches. Here we have a 5881 wireless receiver for an alarm system, specifically the Vistas. Right here is the dip switch module to set the address for this card. The installation manual will have this table in it. It'll explain how to set the dip switches to configure your card for the proper address. Let's take a look at how to read and use this table. We'll look at address number 3 as an example. This module has five switches in it. To convert the switches to binary, let's use the same bucket example that we covered before. Each switch position is a bucket, and this note states that bucket number one must be in the off position, so we're not going to use that bucket. And this note states that bucket five is also used for something other than addressing, so let's get rid of that bucket. Finally, we're left with switches two through four. With three positions, we can represent up to seven addresses. Looking at address 3, the table will tell us how to fill the buckets. This note here states that a dash means off, which actually means your bucket will be empty or a zero. So position 2 is a zero. Position 3 is on, so it'll be a 1. As well as position 4 is on, so it will also be a 1. Okay, we now have enough knowledge to see if these dip switch positions actually represent address number 3. Let's establish the value of each of our buckets. Remember, the far right bucket always has a value of 1. Then each bucket moving to the left doubles in size. All the buckets that have a 1 below them are added together. And there you have it, address 3. Okay, we now know how to read address tables for circuit cards. With this newfound knowledge, we want to expand our home alarm system. We rush out to the store and we buy a Demco 4229 wired zone expander relay module. This will allow us to have 8 more zones in our home alarm. Wait a minute, something looks strange here. Here's address 3 for this circuit card, and this is address 3 for this one. These are most definitely not the same number. I'll give what's going on here. Well, the binary numbering system we just learned, what's known as positive logic. While this second card was built using negative logic. Actually, this is going to be fun. We get to learn something new about electronics. Here's a schematic diagram of that dip switch module we were discussing, or something like it. We've got voltage on one side of the switch, and the switch is open, no voltage is on the other side. This is how a positive logic circuit works. When the switch is open and you're reading zero volts, your output is zero, and your bucket is empty. Now let's close the switch, and your five volts travels down the circuit. When the voltage arrives at the end, your output will be a one. In electronics lingo, this is called the active output. In my videos lingo, we say your bucket is full. There are times, however, this circuit design can have a problem. When it's located near other electronic or electrical things, electromagnetic noise can be introduced into your circuit. This happens most often in automated systems where there's long wire runs. This noise will be interpreted as a voltage, so your circuit could possibly put out a 1 that's false. Or it could go the other direction. A circuit that's putting out a 1 can experience noise that will degrade the circuit voltage to the point where it'll put out a 0 instead of the 1. Okay, is there any way to fix this? Hey, I'm glad you asked. Let's take our voltage power source and move it from this side of the switch over to this side of the switch. You'll have to install a pull-up resistor. The reason why is beyond the scope of this lecture, but let's just say for now because it looks cool. Now take the other side of the switch directly to ground. Finally, you want to mess around with the stuff inside this box to reverse the outputs. With this circuit, an open switch condition will have 5 volts sitting at your output. This will result in an output of 1. The output of this circuit is called negative logic. The reason why it's called negative is, to change the output value, the input value has to become more negative than the normal circuit voltage. In this case, we're looking for a ground on the input. 
Let's take a look at how this works. We close the switch. Your input current is routed across the switch straight to ground, leaving zero volts at the output. The circuit output will change from a one to a zero. And here's the weird part. Your active output is a zero, which means your bucket is full if there's a zero and not a one. So, looking back at our original circuit cards, both set to address three, you can actually now see the pattern. The binary bits are exactly opposite each other because of positive and negative logic. But let's go back and take a look at something that's pretty neat. How is this circuit better than positive logic? Well, you remember our old friend electromagnetic interference that could actually change the outputs of a positive logic circuit? Well, in this circuit, the voltages induced are shunted directly to ground. Your active output is unaffected. Let's take a look at what happens when your switch is open. Here comes your noise. A voltage is induced on the line, and no matter whether the induced voltage is positive or negative, which can increase or decrease your output circuit voltage, we will still get a 1 because all of the induced voltages are still more positive than ground. Let's finish this up. Is there any way to tell which type of logic is being used when you look at a table like this? Surprisingly, the answer is yes. Look at the column labeled 0. If all of the switches are turned off, then you're dealing with positive logic. If you're looking at address 0 and all the switches are turned on, then you're dealing with negative logic. Well, that's about it for this video. In the next video, I'd like to discuss how the computer changes its ones and zeros into a language that us humans can understand.